So I get embarrassed very easily. And when I'm embarrassed, I get incredibly awkward. And so the majority of my life, I've spent my time trying to avoid being embarrassed. For example, one time I was hanging out with my family and we were out for my birthday and someone in my family is my enemy and they told the waitress that I wanted them to sing to me, which truly is my nightmare. I don't know which people actually enjoy this. I'm definitely not one of those people. So I'm sitting there and we're eating dinner and you start to hear the sound of the syncopated clapping coming from the back of the restaurant, right? And you know that clap. You hear it, it's like soft at first and then it starts to get louder. And the entire time I'm listening to this going, oh no, this is for me. And so I begin to panic and just trying to figure out where they are. I actually got up and left the restaurant and these people came and sang to my family as I watched from outside before coming in. I'm, that's just who I am. I have no apologies about that. So for most of my life, I've been able to control whether or not I find myself in embarrassing situations, but that was until I had kids. I don't know if you know this, but little kids have no shame and they don't care if they are embarrassing. In fact, sometimes I think Elise knows I get embarrassed easily and totally messes with me. I mean, she's four, but it seems like that's what she's doing. And one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had with Elise involved the word clap. So when Harper was first born, Harper's 11 months old, when she was first born, Elise was trying to teach her how to clap, but Harper was too little. And this really upset Elise, like it just tore her apart. And so my wife, Ray, began to explain to Elise that babies can't clap. Simple enough, right? Wrong. Because Elise can't say her L's yet. So she doesn't say clap, she says quap, which sounds a lot like crap. And so, of course, we thought this was hilarious. She's running around the house going, Harper can't quap, Harper can't quap. And right, parents of the years, we, we get it. So we thought it was hilarious until I went to Target with her later that week. As we were waiting in line to check out, there's a woman in front of us who had a small child, and Elise, who is incredibly talkative, struck up a conversation with her. And her go-to line was, did you know that babies can't quap? And the woman looked at her and was incredibly confused, so Elise repeated herself, babies can't quap. And you could see the wheels turning because this woman truly believed that Elise was talking to her about crap. And so then she starts talking, Harper can't quap, Rory can't quap, Maeve can't quap, Tate can't quap, literally listing every single baby that she knew. And the look on this woman's face was a mixture of confusion and disgust. And of course, I was mortified. Like, I pick up Elise, I'm like, you don't need to talk to her anymore. I'm so sorry. Stumbling over my words, I tried to explain to this woman that Elise wasn't talking about crap. Of course, we don't sit at home and talk to our child about babies and poop, but it was seriously one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had. And Elise, to this day, still says, Quap. Today, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series called Overflow, and it's all about the power of our words, because the truth is our words matter, what we say, how we say them, and why we say them. It all matters. And the main verse for this series is found in Matthew 12, and, and here's the context. Jesus had just performed a miracle by healing a man who is both blind and mute. And per usual, people are beginning to talk, right? They begin to ask questions. And one of the people there, one of the religious leaders there who saw the miracle actually claims that Jesus got his power from Satan. And other people around there begin to agree. And this is incredibly offensive. And so what Jesus does is he calls them out. He, he calls them bad fruit. He's saying, you all bear bad fruit. He calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them evil. And then he says this in Matthew 12. He says, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Another translation says it like this, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here's another way to put it. What is in your heart determines what you say. So if you speak hate, that is what your heart is full of. If you speak joy, that is what your heart is full of. Now that's heavy, right? Like just thinking about that, that's heavy. Because when we say things that are mean or hurtful or negative, we often try to convince ourselves and the people around us that that is out of our character. But Jesus teaches you speak what your heart is full of. The problem is this isn't really something that we actively think about, right? We don't think about this before we speak, before we post, before we text. That's why we're doing this sermon series. 
Because that's something that we as a community and just people in general need to change about ourselves. In fact, just being completely honest, I decided we were doing this series because of a situation I experienced on Facebook last February. Last February, I came home from work early one day feeling like I was getting sick. And you all know that feeling where you can tell your body is fighting and it's very clearly losing. And so I started to get a fever. I had chills. I had that pressure in my chest. So I came home and I laid down to try and sleep it off. And I literally woke up three days later. And so I ended up having the flu and bronchitis and it was, it was miserable. But when I finally stopped being a zombie and started to feel better, Ray and I were having dinner with some friends when they started to talk about a conversation that had been happening on Facebook. And calling it a conversation, to be honest, is putting it politely. But I had no idea what was going on. I'd been off for social media for a few days, so I looked it up. And to be honest, it hurt my soul to read the comments. What started as a pretty polarizing post turned into people on both sides of the argument attacking each other. And the thing that hurt me the most was that a large number of the people arguing were connected to this church. Comment after comment. There was no empathy. There was no compassion. There was just hate and judgment and personal attacks. And it was just plain mean. Now listen, I hate that I even have to say this, but in today's climate, I clearly have to. I know this is shocking, but people are allowed to have different opinions. What? No way. You're wrong for thinking that. I know. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> we are allowed to disagree with one another. Now, it's true that some of our opinions are dumb, right? Some of my opinions are dumb. Some of your opinions are dumb. It's also true that none of us fully understand everything about everything because we're not God. In fact, there are many people at Collective that disagree about a ton of things, and that's okay. It's okay that some of you are Cowboys fans. It's okay. It's okay that some of you believe Dunkin' Donuts is better than Starbucks, because it's not. It's okay that some of you think Old Bay isn't a gift from God. That's one of those dumb opinions. I think we'd all agree on that. But it is okay that we disagree about small things and big things. It really is but it is not okay to treat people poorly. It is not okay to use our words as weapons. In fact, there have only been a few people in the history of this church where I've had to sit down and talk about their future here, and it was not because of their opinions. It wasn't because we disagreed about church or God or the Bible. It's always been about how they treated other people. And specifically, it's been about how they talked to and about other people. So as, as I read the comments that day, the thing that upset me the most was that I knew many of these people, some I knew better than others, and I knew that the way they were communicating on Facebook wasn't truly indicative of who they want to be as people. And it wasn't indicative of how they wanted to treat people, including people they disagree with. And that's when I realized that we, including myself, we as a society do not believe that our words carry the same weight as our actions. They carry the same joy, they carry the same pain, they carry the same hope, and they carry the same hate. Our words carry the same weight as our actions because we live in a world full of opinions and platform, and what we say matters. Our words have power. Proverbs 18.21 says it like this, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Our words have the power to give life, and our words have the power of death. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your words have the power to give life just as much as they have the power to bring death? Because I don't think we fully understand this. Right? I don't think I fully understand this. The words we say, the words we type, the words we send, they bring life or death. In 2018, the Huffington Post did a study pertaining to a book called The Five Love Languages. And this is an idea coined by this guy named Gary Chapman. And he says, and he believes that people feel loved in very specific ways. And so he actually breaks it down into five. There's words of affirmation, physical touch, quality time, receiving gifts, and acts of service. And you can go online, Google five love language. You can take the test. It will, if you are having trouble in any of your relationships, take this test and communicate the results to them. But in a recent study, they actually found that approximately 25% of people have words of affirmation as their primary love language. One out of every four people, that's their number one. 
But they also found out that 20% of people have words of affirmation as their secondary love language. You have two. And so around 45% of the population feels loved and appreciated through words. That means in every relationship you have, the odds are pretty good that one of you feel loved and cared for and appreciated through the other person's words. But this also means that in every relationship you have, there's someone that gets crushed by those same words. Because words can tear down and destroy just as easily as they can build and create. So if we are not pleasing to God with our words, it shows that our heart is in a very bad place. It gives evidence to what is in our hearts. And so over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about our heart, and the overflow of that is the words that we say. And our words have the power to tear people down. They have the power to build people up, and they matter. And this is a topic that the Bible talks a lot about. Quite possibly the most famous verse on the power of our words are found in the book of James in the New Testament. And the book of James is a really rough book. James, though, really cool story about him. He's actually the brother of Jesus. And you read back in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographies of Jesus, you read that James disagrees with his brother. James does not believe that Jesus came from God. James does not believe that he's the Messiah, the one that was sent to rescue us. But what's really cool is James actually watches Jesus' life from afar, and eventually after Jesus dies and resurrects from the dead, James experiences that. James experiences the resurrection of his own brother, and after seeing that, he believed. A side note, this is one of the reasons why I believe that Jesus is who he said he is, because his brother believed it. Because what would it take for you to believe that your sibling was the Messiah, right? My brother tells me anything. I don't think he's telling the truth. You know, and Jesus says, this is who I am. And James experienced that for himself, saw it for himself. And James believed. And he goes on to become one of the pillars of early Christianity. He writes the book of James. And the whole book is challenging Christians to have a real and authentic faith. And he focuses on the way that Christians live, challenging them to have actions and words that reflect Jesus. And so this is what he says about the words that we use in James 3. He says, indeed, we all make many mistakes. I feel that. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So James is teaching us that if we can control what we say, we will actually have self-control in other areas of our life. Right? He's saying if you start with this, Self-control and everything else that you do actually kind of hinges on this thing. And he goes on to explain, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. 2008, 18, the wildfire season in California was the deadliest and most destructive wildfire season ever recorded. There were a total of 8,500 fires that burned over 1.9 million acres. The total cost to date right now, and it's still going up because they're still assessing damage, is over $12 billion. And at the end of the entire season, over 100 people had died. And do you know how most of them start? People. Humans have been recorded as the main cause of wildfires in California and various causes, some intentional, but mostly accidental, such as unattended campfires, fireworks, cigarettes, and cars have contributed to the increase in the number of fires, right? Our words are powerful. 1.9 million acres of destruction, powerful. $12 billion of destruction, powerful. Our words matter. James continues, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now, James is not being subtle. Like He is a, not a subtle writer. If you go back and read this book today, take it very slowly in small chunks at a time. But what he's saying is it can set your whole life on fire. And listen, James isn't talking about someone else doing that to you, which is possible. So many of us have experienced what other people have said about you, said to you, said around you, and it's hurt. Right? You still hold on to those things. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But James is saying this hurts you. Your tongue, what you say, hurts you when you lie, when you gossip, 
when you slander, when you complain, when you're hurtful. It continues, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And this is an incredibly important reminder from James. Even the people you disagree with are made in the image of God. He's teaching us that's how we treat them. Do they always deserve it? No. Do we always deserve it? No. But just because we don't like someone or we don't like what someone thinks doesn't mean they should be treated any other way than a person who's made in the image of God with grace. That's what we want. And James is saying it's the reminder that every person we talk to should be treated the same way. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with, it, with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. James actually simplifies these statements earlier in James 1 when he says this. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot praise God and curse people made in the image of God with the same tongue. Because if you do, you're fooling yourself. He's saying you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself if you praise Jesus on Sunday morning, then tear people down with your words on Monday. You're lying to yourself if you pray to God at night and pray on people on message boards in the morning. You're lying to yourself if you speak about grace and the love that Jesus offers, but you offer none of it to the people that you speak to. Your words matter. But here's the thing. The Bible also teaches us what we should say, right? It's not just trying to correct what we do wrong. It's not just trying to teach us the severity of our words. It actually teaches us how we should speak to people. It teaches us how we can bring life. Colossians 4 says, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Other translations say that our conversation should, should be seasoned with salt, pleasing, loving, kind. Ephesians 4.29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Our words should be good and helpful and lift people up. Proverbs 15.28, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. Our words should be thoughtful. Jesus actually expounds on this in Matthew 12. When he says this, he says, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. That word idle comes from the Greek word argon, which literally means free of labor, or it means didn't do the work that was expected. So here's what Jesus is saying. Think before you speak. And this is especially important when you need to have hard conversations with people, when you need to challenge them or confront them or just anything that needs to push people forward. Before doing that, you need to think what you're about to say. You need to ask yourself, am I the right person? Is this the right time? Is this the right place? And the one that I struggle with the most is, am I in the right mind? Is my, is my heart in the right place to have this conversation with that person? If the answer is no to any one of those questions, don't talk. Think before you speak. Psalm 34 says, then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. You should speak the truth. Now, this is not an excuse to hurt people because you can actually tell the truth while still being gracious. You got to figure out what that balance looks like. Philippians 2, 14 says, do everything without complaining or arguing. We probably don't really want to talk about that one, do we? No. All right. And Proverbs 10, 19 says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. This one's my favorite. This is why. When I was a freshman in college, I, I was that person. I just, if I had an opinion, I just said it. I, I still kind of do that. I'm working on it a lot. But when I was a freshman in college, I actually had a friend say to me once, not everyone cares what you think. And I know this sounds mean, but I think it legitimately was the best advice anyone has ever given me because sometimes it's best not to say anything. And so the question becomes, how do we make sure our words bring life and not death? How do we make sure our words build each other up? How do we make sure they're seasoned with salt? It goes back to Matthew 12. For out of the overflow of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. Your words show what your heart is full of. If, you, if your words speak hate, your heart is full of hate. If your words speak complaints, your heart is full of complaints. If your words speak gossip, your heart is full of gossip. If your words speak greed, your heart is full of greed. If your words speak jealousy, your heart is full of jealousy. And if your words speak bitterness, that's what your heart is full of. So the first thing that every single one of us need to do is we need to audit our heart. We need to ask ourselves, what fills my heart? What am I consuming? Am I consuming anger? Am I consuming gossip? Am I consuming resentment? Am I consuming hate? And once you do that, once you actually try to figure out what are you putting into your life, putting into your head, putting into your heart, that leads to the two applications that we have for today, and they're super simple. It's remove the negative and insert the positive. When I was in college, I had a roommate that was very sarcastic and incredibly negative. And at first, it didn't, it didn't really bother me. It was just part of his personality. But in my second year of living with him, I started to realize that he was actually rubbing off on me. Every comment I made was negative. It was pessimistic. It was petty. I started struggling with gossip. My words were definitely not seasoned with salt. And I immediately knew what was going on because I'd been living with him for two years, and I was being passive about what I was putting into my life and what I was putting into my heart. So at the end of my sophomore year, I switched my roommates, and I started living with someone who was constantly positive. He's an encourager. He's slow to speak and quick to listen. And for me, it was a breath of fresh air. And my wife, I was sharing this with her earlier, she's like, I remember the attitude change. I had to remove the negative and insert the positive. And so some of you need to make some changes in order to remove that negative influence in your life. And the first place you should start is social media. Now, it's really easy to blame social media, but the truth is we are the problem. We're the problem. We can blame social media all day long. It's changing culture, doing all these things. We are on social media. It is our fault. Social media just gives us a platform for sharing what's in our heart. And for some reason, we still think that no one else reads it but us. But ultimately, that's on us. We are the problem. But one thing that is true, and psychologists have actually confirmed this, is that if you consume all the hate and negativity and meanness on social media, you will begin to speak that way. Psychologists are digging into the impact of social media. They've already found that it leads to anxiety and jealousy and anger. But what's really fascinating is that after studying people and their anger and, and specifically going into aggressive situations on social media, they have learned that social media actually makes it worse. It's somewhat of a domino effect on people. And they've concluded that we emulate the people and attitudes that we consume on social media. That's why it feels like when you're online now, it just gets worse and worse and worse, right? Because we're consuming it every single day, sometimes passively, sometimes intentionally. And that's what we're filling our heart with. And that's our overflow. And so if you want to change the words you speak, you need to start by removing some of the negative people in your life. Yes, I'm telling you that you need to unfriend people, not just on social media, but in life. And I'm telling you that you need to block people. It's whatever you need to do. And I know this sounds mean, but if you're scrolling through social media and you find yourself getting angry, you find yourself getting upset about someone's post because it hits home, you find yourself getting annoyed because people use Facebook as their own personal complaint board, and then you find yourself gossiping about all the things that you just read, unfriend or at least block those people. One thing I've learned over the past few years through counseling is that negative words, I'm a words of affirmation person, so, but positive words don't really impact me. Like I'm super weird and awkward around positive words, but negative words hit me about twice as hard. And so one thing that I'm working through now is I realize like when I get online and I read those things, when I spend time with people who tear me down, it impacts how I'm feeling. And that impacts my attitude. That impacts how I talk to people how patient I am with people, how much grace I offer people, how I interact with my family and my friends. It impacts my entire attitude. While writing the sermon this week, I realized that I get super angry when I see people complaining about dumb stuff on Facebook because then what I do is then I complain about them. And so I decided for me, the best thing for me to do is I'm gonna block these people because I realize that it impacts me. I am a words person. I take that in and I give that back out to my family and that's unfair. And I know what you're thinking. What if that hurts their feelings? We've been friends for a long time, I can't do that. What if one day they post something online and I'm the only person that can help solve their problem? It's your choice, right? You choose what you consume. 
I also know that talking about removing people from your life, many of you are wondering, what if, what if they're family? The truth is, family is not exempt from this. You may not be able to remove them completely, but you have to set up guardrails. We talked about this back in March. You have to set up boundaries and limit the amount of time you spend with these people. Right? You have to put boundaries in place so that in you're in those conversations, you can walk away from those conversations. Just because they're family doesn't mean you can't filter out the negative that they bring into your life. And so for every single one of us today, there are people in our life, whether it's on social media or people that are right in front of us that we need to remove, that we need to block, that we need to avoid, that we need to stay away from because we know when we walk away from those conversations, how do you feel? Because that's what you're giving to other people. And so you start by removing the negative and then you insert the positive. If you want what you say to build people up, to bring people life, to impact other people, you have to make a decision to insert those types of influences in your life. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this, the best place to start is with him. If you want to speak grace, your heart must be full of grace. If you want to speak love, your heart must be full of love. If you want to speak joy, your heart must be full of joy. And the only place where those truly come from is through a relationship with Jesus. Romans 5 says this, And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. So this is where you start. If you want your words to give life, you have to accept the life that Jesus offers you. Romans 6 says this, for we died and were buried by Christ, or with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. This is why we celebrate baptism, because it's people putting their faith in Jesus and choosing to fill their hearts with hope and peace and grace and joy, all the good stuff that he offers, so that can be their overflow. They're choosing new life. That's what they want. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate as Isaac gets baptized. Isaac is 11. He turns 12 in three days. He wanted you all to know that. <laughs> He's making one of the most important decisions that he could ever make to trust Jesus and put his faith in him. And so you'll see Isaac is a young man that loves Jesus, and his words and his actions are reflecting that today. And for some of you, this is where you start. If you want to put the right stuff into your heart, you start with Jesus, who offers the best stuff. Now, for those of you who have made that step, and maybe over time you've veered, right? Over time, you, you've realized that you spend too much time inputting things in your life that you don't need. The first thing that you need to do is you need to surround yourself with people who will lift you up, that give you life. That means spending time in intentional relationships. Some of you have friends in your life that you don't need to be friends with. That's just the truth. You choose who you're surrounded by, and the second thing you need to do is start reading your Bible. Jesus will teach you the best way to live, but you have to read it for yourself. You have to choose to insert the right things into your life and allow them to influence how you speak. You choose what you consume. A few years ago, a friend of mine shared an American folktale in his sermon. I want to share it with you all today. It starts like this. Once upon a time, an old man began to spread rumors that his neighbor was a thief. And as a result, his neighbor was arrested. During the trial, the neighbor was proved innocent after the judge realized that the old man's claims were simply untrue. But after being released, people continued to think of the neighbor as a thief, even though he was not guilty. It impacted his job. It impacted his relationships. It impacted everything. And so the neighbor, understanding this, decided that he was actually going to sue the old man for wrongly accusing him and messing up his entire life. And in court, the old man actually told the judge there were just comments he made while he was angry. He didn't really mean to harm anyone. And the judge, before passing the sentence, told the old man to write everything he said about his neighbor down on a piece of paper and then cut up the paper on the way home, let it go out the window. And he said, then tomorrow you'll come back and hear your sentence. So the next day, the judge told the old man, before receiving the sentence, you will have to go out and gather all the pieces of paper that you threw out yesterday. The old man was furious. He said, I can't do that. The wind took them, and I don't know where to find them. And then the judge replied, in the same way, simple words may destroy the honor of a man to such an extent that one is not able to fix it. Our words are powerful. What we say, how we say them, it matters. And once they're spoken, the impact is vast. So allow our hearts to speak words that are full of grace, Words that are full of truth, words that bring life. 
right? Words that encourage and lift people up. But the only way that will ever truly happen is if we begin to remove the negative things that are in our life and insert it with positive things. And the truth is we, ha- we have to do this. We have to care more about what we say and what we post and what we send because how much better if this, would this world be if we cared about what we said? Right? How much less hate would exist? How much less gossip would exist? How much less pain would exist if our words spoke life instead of death? If our overflow lifted people up and encouraged people and loved people and showed people the grace that we don't deserve but we all need? Let's pray. God, I know, um, I know that uh, I struggle with how I talk to people. Um, God, I struggle with what I say. God, I know there are many times in my life, in my day, um, where one moment I'm praising you and the next I'm talking to people like they're not made in your image. God, I, I pray that we recognize today that our words matter. God, that they're powerful. God, that we live in a society today where our words are more prevalent and more seen by people even beyond our reach, beyond our city, beyond our state than they ever were before. And because of that, we have to care about what is in our heart. God, because of that, we have to care about what we're putting in so our overflow can be gracious and loving and kind. God, I just pray for everybody here that recognizes that there is some person in their life that doesn't need to be there God, I I pray that you give them the courage to take that step. God, I also pray that they experience the freedom that you offer when they remove that negativity from their life. And God, I pray this week we can take a step toward filling our hearts with better things, with real relationships, God, with your word, and ultimately the love that you offer us. God, thank you that we have the power to speak. God, I just pray that we care way more about what we say. God, we love you. I pray these things in your name. Amen.